Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. By believing passionately in something that still does not exist, we create it. The non-existent is whatever we have not sufficiently desired. Is a quote from the Bohemian writer Franz Kafka, a major figure in the 20th century literature. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our guest today, a serial entrepreneur who with passion, guided by principles and surrounded by the right people, revolutionised the health and wellness sector in Australia. Our guest is Radik Sali, chairman and founder of Light Warrior Group, an investment firm committed to creating shared value by investing in business that are socially responsible and environmentally conscious. In addition, Radek is also executive chairman of Made by Cow, and Wonderlust Nutrition, a director of Stratosphere, Anthem, Igniting Change, as well as the Hawthorne Football Club. He was previously Chief Executive Officer of Swiss Wellness Group. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners from all over the world, please don't forget to follow on your preferred podcast platform. And for our listeners in Norway, Canada, and Switzerland, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner at Blender Partners, Executive Search and Board Advisory. In today's episode, we speak to a key figure in one of the biggest private company transactions in Australian history. As Chief Executive of the Swiss Wellness Group, Radek helped negotiate the sale of the group to Hong Kong listed Bias Time for $1.7 billion. He shares with us the guiding principles that have seen him galvanize people towards a common purpose, the pioneering exploits in positioning a premium product, as well as the important lessons learned in a fascinating journey. Today, Radek continues to advocate for a purpose-driven approach to business, having founded Light Warrior Group, investing in socially responsible and environmentally conscious ventures. We hear of the efforts of the Australian business community in tackling what is arguably the greatest problem of our time. So sit back and enjoy creating the culture. Radek, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm going to start with a bit of a doozy, Radek. If you could change one thing in the world, what would it be and why? I think it would be that we need to move to a collective plan B, uh, not just focused on shareholder returns. We need to be thinking about everyone that comes in contact with our organisations that we operate. Four out of five of us work in private businesses. And so we're the most influential group um, in, in formulating what society is about. And so we, we need to be really considerate of that as leaders and we need to all move in unison to, to help, I suppose, preserve this version of, of capitalism we have. Sounds good in theory, Radek. How do we do it? I, I think we've got to start practising and being really aware of what is is it that's a strength in terms of how we are different to other competitors to, to democracy and capitalism. And, and so how we are different, we, we need to appreciate the freedom of thought that we have. We need to nurture that. Uh, we need to develop those fundamental foundations and champion them and not be so focused on, on, on many of the negatives. The negatives are important and, and we need to improve, but we need to do a whole lot better in championing what we do extraordinarily well. And in a country like Australia, Radic, how do you think business is perceived? I think it's got a lot of work to do. I, I think that it's improved a lot. Um, the conversations that CEOs, chairs, directors are having around culture 
and the importance of people being happy at work has changed significantly. Um, and that's warmed my heart. Um, you know, when, when we were first talking about the importance of culture back in 2005 at, at Swiss, yep. um, it was a very different environment. It was kind of the warm and fluffy, fuzzy stuff that wasn't really important. Uh, whereas we made it fundamental to our business plan. And, and now I really do think that there is a real movement to ensuring that culture is paramount in achieving our business outcomes. All right, we'll come to that in a few minutes. Why don't we go back to the beginnings then, Ruddick? Where, where did you grow up? And I guess maybe some of the sort of the clearest memories, childhood, and was there an inkling in those early days that you're going to venture into business? I grew up in, luckily, in Hawthorne, lucky enough to, to grow up in Leafy Hawthorne in Melbourne. Um, so a, a beautiful place, family oriented and, um, and, and full of um, other kids to kind of get up to mischief and play sport with. Um, so that was fantastic. And my parents had, had come from uh, difficult backgrounds. So they both come from uh, refugee backgrounds. My father's parents were, were from uh, Albania. Okay. Uh, his, his father came out in the 20s during the Depression, actually, a little bit earlier than that. And then also my mother, she's a uh, Czech background and she was a refugee through the UK and got a, what do you, whatever you call it, a green card for Australia um, and ended up here as well and met my father. And so both of them had basically come from nothing, dad, champions the fact that he learned a lot most of his lot picking tomatoes in Shepparton um, which is pretty hard work in, in the middle of summer there mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and my mother was a, a violinist uh, with the Czech Symphony Orchestra wow. um, but, but became a medical scientist because I suppose a, a lot of um, sadness came with playing that instrument so so they came from nothing and really gave me a lot and every opportunity so I'm, I'm very thankful for everything they did to um, enable me to live out my life. What made you say that? A lot of sadness came from playing the instrument, the violin. When she left the Czech Republic, the Prague Spring happened. And yeah. so the Russians moved in and essentially um, it meant that she couldn't go back and visit her family without uh, essentially going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so probably that's that's my real focus on, on why I think it's important we nurture our version of capitalism and democracy. Um, we've seen regimes like that mm -hmm. uh, uh, create oppression and real difficulties for mass populations and, and actually rise and fall in, in, in our lifetime. Okay. So uh, early career, where did you make your first move? Well, my first move was a paper rounds, <laughs> uh, which, which, you know, I, I never missed a, uh, I never had a, a sick day throughout my whole career. So I was very, very proud of that. And, I, and then I progressed on to the local delicatessen okay. and many other uh, sorts of jobs where it was mainly focused on cleaning and kind of the menial tasks until I, I finished school. And I, I had the wonderful opportunity of working at Village Road Show. And I went for an interview there. And, and because uh, our family were involved in a couple of cinemas regionally in Shepparton and Bendigo, okay. I got to meet the CEO. And the CEO asked, you know, the interview went really well. And the CEO asked me, you know, which, which side I want, do I want to work at? And I said, um, I said, Forest Hill. And he said, oh, that's a Hoyt's. <laughs> so he said, I'll put you at Dog Master. Don't worry, mate. <laughs> and so that was a great first, uh, first day on the job. And you drew that there, through, um, through uni? Uh, yeah, I did that through uni. And, and from there, I realized pretty quickly that, hey, I'm paying for uni to learn about business and, and kind of other things and the next steps in life. Yep. Uh, but I'm getting paid to turn up to work at Village Roadshow and learn about selling, learn about what, what's essential to, to running a business. And, and so quickly, I became a, a shift supervisor and, and progressed to management and essentially um, uh, did my own apprenticeship um, that I was wonderfully paid for and, and had to learn not to be uh, essentially a dickhead um, because these same people that I was working with were the people that I'd catch up with socially. Um, so it was about garnering and learning to respect each other and getting people to, to find purpose in what you did, um, even if it was as many or as upselling uh, to a large Coke and a, a large popcorn and inspiring people to do that. Um, learning that technique nice and early was, was, a, was a really a great asset. Are Australians good salespeople? I think we are. When we're authentic about what we do, uh, when we going. believe and, and we're true, <laughs> we, we, we can make it so. I think, um, and we sell a great dream of Australia being an extraordinary place, and it, and it is a pretty extraordinary place. So, yeah, we're good salespeople. Well, what was the step into to Swiss then? Well, that was a obviously significant part of your life. 
So maybe you can talk us through how that came about. Yeah, so I was at, at Philly Drug Show for 11 years. I'd, I'd worked internationally and I'd come back to Australia and, and I'd kind of progressed as far as I thought I would. And, and I was 27 and, and that CEO I spoke of, he was a, you know, a 30-year-old CEO of a publicly listed company. So he, he would, would have been about 35 by the time he left. And I just knew that the organisation wasn't going to go young again with a CEO and, and even, even him being a 30-year-old uh, CEO of a near billion dollar business is, is pretty impressive in Very itself. Impressive. Yeah. Uh, and the business was going through massive change. So there was a lot of focus on costs and, and structuring, which was probably an area, um, you know, I had good experience in, but a, a tried and true practitioner needed to do that. Um, so it was time to look elsewhere and, and, and through... Uh, networks of, of family, my father being the, the first professor of surgery here in Australia to talk about diet causing disease back in the 70s. Right, okay. He was laughed at when that happened and it took 20 years later, his, his work was published in the British Medical Journal and now we all know that diet is an essential part of keeping our health um, in a good place. He, he used supplements to help his patients be in best possible health to deal with, you know, the, the, the treatment of chronic disease, the Western treatment of chronic disease. Makes a whole lot of sense to be as healthy as you, you possibly can be to deal with a chronic disease. And, and part of that is getting nutrition right. And so uh, there was a company called Swiss that he would help out with their formulations, didn't take a cent for it. He just wanted to make sure that whatever he was recommending was, was the best quality and we get the best possible outcome for his patients. And, and so, I knew the managing director really well and, and we got on and he actually had tried to, to get me to come across to Swiss a couple of years earlier and it wasn't the right time for me and, and it became the right time. And um, so at 28, I was operations manager of Swiss. It was turning 13 million in revenue and that became one of the greatest rides of my life for the next over a decade. All right. So operations manager, what did you walk into? What was the scale of the business? I understand the revenues, but the size of the team, market coverage, where were you sitting and what were you tasked to deliver? It was it's privately owned, uh, 30 odd people. So not, not uh, big at all, 30 it, people? Yeah, that's right. Uh, did a little bit of manufacturing, a little bit of logistics. And also there was a, probably, a, it was an extraordinary induction where I got to work every area of the business. But uniquely, I wasn't shown any financials. Um, so there was a bit of paranoia around the fact that, you know, being a private business, we don't want to show everything we do. Yeah. So I wasn't shown them for six months. So how you be as an operations manager of a company um, and, and manage it uh, without KPIs and financials was something that oh, I had to really think about how I went about it. And so uh, I spent my time listening to customers, listening to who we sold to and, and asking them about the dynamics of, you know, why do you have so much space for Centrum, uh, which was the number one selling multivitamin? You must get the best margin out of it. And I'd, I'd say, no, no. It's uh, this guy here, which was a, a poster of Rob D. Costello, oh, yeah. uh, who is a, a successful gold medalist at the Commonwealth Games. And, you know, he, he would have been uh, in his, you know, well-retired, uh, you know, at least a decade on. Um, but a familiar face to all, and they advertised 52 weeks of the year. They had a, a lot of funding behind them. It was Pfizer that owned them, and they were the biggest right. company in the world then. Yeah. And, and so it wasn't best margin. It was the advertising. It was the point of sale. And, you know, I'd come from cinemas where I would go to barbecues and I'd see this phenomenon play out as well and say to people, you know, I worked at Swiss, and I'd gone from being the centre of conversation where we'd be talking about Russell Crowe and Gladiator and his new film and Lord of the Rings and excitement in Hollywood. And every week there was a new product coming out. And, and you know, it was great, you know, it would be, you know, you'd be centre of attention. And then suddenly you get to these barbecues and, and it's so where do you work? And I say vitamins and, you know, most, most, you know, most people would say, okay, yep, yeah, and change the subject. And then some of the new range of vitamin C coming out and the flavours or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, it's correct. So, and then, you know, they say, what company? I say Swiss. They go, what, the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, if they hadn't asked me about vitamins, uh, 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 and I'd say, what, they'd say, what, the embassy? And I'd say, no, no, no vitamins. Um, so, so I kind of noticed that there was not much stardust around. And the reason why is because, you, you know, aside from, you know, Rob D. Costello, and, and the beautiful Centrum packaging, every other company were advertising, uh, you know, UTI, you know, urinary tract infection. Um, and it's not really barbecue chat um, or IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, you're not really going to go into that area. No, don't and so that when I was, 
Yeah, correct. So when I was walking into the uh, into the pharmacy, I'd see lit up on the other side is is the cosmetics area, beautifully packaged, and, and they had all these beautiful people presenting these products. Yep. And they looked beautiful on the outside, but of course we need to be beautiful on the inside to be beautiful from the outside as well. And so just saw a gaping hole for a lifestyle product. And so we, we just thought about how we could do it better. And Ricky Ponding, when you took our product, and, and by this stage, I'd, I'd progressed to being general manager, and, and, and six months after that, I became a CEO. No, I was and, just on um, that. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty mm. fast moving. Is it what, 28 year old, didn't you say? Yeah, so yeah, by, by yeah. Okay, right. so how, how, okay, so how do you outstrip performance in that regard? For everybody, anyone out there who's building their mm. career, what's, yeah. the, what's the key points? Because that's, that's moving at a you know, at warp speed. It was, and I just think it's it's focusing on the strengths that are already in front of you, the controllables, and how you can optimise those. So a lot of people have connections, um, but it's making good of them. So I would see it many times over. A director's son would start a, a village roadshow in the candy bar, and they would just not take the role seriously. And it wouldn't work out for them. They wouldn't progress in that organisation. Um, you, you had to put in... To, to make do of it. So yes, we had a connection through a family involvement in the cinema and I had that meeting with that CEO that I almost messed up, but I made the most of it and I worked my guts out and I saw very quickly that, you know, being paid to work and learn about business process was a pretty extraordinary thing. And then practicing, practicing that ability to lead in whatever you do, in whatever circumstance is something you, you need to do. You know, you think of and I found I was pretty good at it too. So it's not you watching a lot of Gladiator when you got home at night, were you? Or yeah, correct. It's pretty. It was pretty easy to find inspiration yeah. when you had that, that, that amount of wonderful product going on, and and then also see how you know how people got excited by it. Yeah, yeah. and 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 so when, when there was a talking point, it dragged people in, and you'd see certain films um, because of the, the personalities or the content. Uh, you know, it, it became the theme or the conversation of what everyone was 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 excited about. And we still see that today in TV and, and film. Okay, but if I'm the chief exec, you're the, the young start coming in at 28. You've got a good role. And as you say, being promoted. Why am I listening to you? <laughs> uh, so the fact was that that chief exec, MD, had been in that business since he was 15, 16 years old and, and, and had driven it as far as he could drive it which is, I would say, is the hardest part, that, that starting part, getting it to that first 10 million bucks worth of sale, creating a brand that has resonance and, and knock-on, and a couple of products that are winners, like the, the men's and women's multivitamin, mm -hmm. that was already um, selling as the number two brand across the, the country and was recommended and people would come back to it because it was of quality and they'd notice the difference. And so it was an easy sell for the pharmacist. So the missing point was marketing it. And marking in a way that was aspirational and lifestyle driven and, and topical in conversation. And thankfully, you know, a few other trends happened in our favor. Uh, wellness became a theme, you know, it became something we could boast about. We can't boast about our, our riches or our amazing car, but we can boast about marathons we might be training for, detoxes we're doing. It's a talkability point and it's very socially acceptable um, to do so. But getting back to to how, how that kind of CEO saw that. He, he just saw that it was time for transition. And I'd come from a big company um, where process and structure was the secret to our success, you know, repeating the flywheel and, and doing more of what we do well and doing that really, really well and better and better as we go, drove the foundations of, of how Village went ahead. And, and so that's what was missing at Swiss. It was driven by one person and 30 people that would follow that whatever one person's direction was and, and would rely on that person to really review and, and, and make sure every step was um, considered and thought about by him uh, before it was signed off. So I, I brought in new new talent and we transitioned in a really comfortable way and I was very respectful. We, we, he, he was my mentor uh, uh, right throughout and, and we, we were very, very close and he progressed to a, a board role and, and had uh, a lot of life freedoms that he was craving for as a result of me stepping into the role. So Okay. There wasn't anything untoward about that, and it was always the plan. All right, Radic. So how do you then still take everybody on the journey, which is the, the other 30, and mm. the chief exec has now moved on to the board and put a proposition that I'm going to scale this business enormously? Exactly. So uh, we always thought global, and we had to. We were called Swiss, so we couldn't, you know, with this Australian business called Swiss, 
Uh, so we couldn't position ourselves as Australian made and Australian owned and all this sort of thing because it was kind of a, a juxtaposition to, to what the brand was. So thinking global actually helped us in a big way. Okay. Uh, we had to think global. We had to be premium in quality because you couldn't be a Swiss product without being premium. And by being a premium, we sat 20% more expensive than everyone else in the category. Is that deliberate? Uh, and then You're deliberately putting your price up? Well, well well, it wasn't. It was. It was, a, it was just the fact of the quality of the ingredients we were choosing to use. It made it a more expensive product, and as a result of that quality, we had the highest retention of any product in the category. Um, so it was a good sixty, seventy percent of people that tried that product. Yep. They stuck with it, okay. and and so you know that the missing formula was to go and advertise hard and tell people about it because we knew that when we had people trial our product. They stuck with it, and and our audience got bigger and bigger, and and that carried on right through our success period, right through to the point where we had over a hundred thousand resellers of our product selling into China. You're listening to No Limitations with special guest Radek Sully. In our next episode, I sit down with aviator, explorer, businessman, publisher, filmmaker, and former Australian of the Year, Dick Smith, AC. So I told the media, I said, I'm going to turn Iceberg to Sydney and I'm going to cut it up into ice cubes and call them Dixicles. And I'm going to sell them for 10 cents each. The ABC rang me and they wanted to charter a plane out to go and film the iceberg. And in the end, we had thousands of people coming down to the headlands as we towed the iceberg up to the opera house. Be sure to join us on our next episode of No Limitations. And now back to the show. One of your major innovations was the pioneering, I guess, in the use of the brand ambassador. So you want to talk us through that journey? I think you started off with Ricky Ponting. Yeah, so Ricky was taking the product and so we gave him a call and, and he, he did a deal with us that cost us a, a bit less than doing a deal with the Australian cricket team who were saying to us, you're supplying product, now you need to do a, a deal with as being choice of the Australian cricket team. Okay. And we said, okay, what's that going to cost? And, and we're like, okay, well, we, we'll just go to an individual and do it a bit more cost effectively. And we did that deal with Ricky and Ricky was authentically taking our product. The dietitian ended up working with us at Swiss and we knew she was recommending our, our product to the, the whole cricket team. So warning was on it the whole lot back in the golden age. Um, and, and Ricky was the best batsman in the country. So to me, he struck as a, uh, struck me as a, a more relevant, uh, ambassador than say Rob De Costello, who you know, ten years on, probably not as um, connected with the audience as the second most important person to the prime minister, the captain of the Australian cricket team. So we we yeah we brought him on, and I knew we'd made it when I was driving in one morning, and we'd spent nine hundred thousand dollars on on this campaign sponsoring the cricket, and um, our adverts cost uh, less than fifty k, and and one of them was a classic. They were all three were classics. You can, you can check them out on, on YouTube. Uh, but it was one where Ricky Pony was doing some cleaning around the house and we sped it up and it was as if the multivitamin giving him all these streaks. And they're terrible ads. Um, and, and so Husey and Kate were, were on Nova and they were, they were doing this poll on what's the most annoying advert on TV. And, and we just kept coming up and, and we won most annoying advert. We had cut through. So for our 50K, I couldn't be happier uh, with the result we were getting because people were noticing our adverts and, and also our pharmacists were noticing and they were saying, what's the next campaign? And so uh, then I asked my mum, I said, so, you know, because I went to Priceline, I presented on Ricky Ponding and the buyer said to me, 90% of their audience are female. The buyer said to me, oh, I said, we've got Ricky Ponting. They said, who? And I said, oh, I'm missing a whole audience here. There's a whole bunch of ladies that don't really know who Ricky Ponting is. And so I asked mum, what's her favourite show? And it was Dancing with the Stars. And Sonia Kruger was the host of that. And again, we did a deal directly with Sonia Kruger. Channel 7 were, were pretty disappointed that Sonia Kruger hadn't signed up to a car company or some big spending advertising firm. Five years on, they, they, they were very, very happy and pleased that we partnered with Sonia. And so we were the first uh, lifestyle advert to use the talent, first advert to use the talent from the show in a lifestyle program mm -hmm. in the actual show. So now when you see the block and all the contestants in adverts or the hosts of it, we were the first ones to do that. So it was quite controversial at the time on the TV TV was very protective of their talent, but we changed the dynamic and we only advertised 
with our advertising, as I said, with really ponding in the cricket. So we only got that audience that were watching the cricket, which is a big audience. Yep. And the same thing with Dancing with the Stars, which was the number one show on television at the time and, and would only advertise with Sonia Kruger in that program. So it was in situ. And so you'd, you'd get a loyal audience that were actually interested in hearing what that that talent had to say about the product. And, and as I said, not, not many brands were doing that because it just wasn't happening in, in particular in lifestyle programs. Sporting programs had started to happen but no one was doing a lifestyle so that was our method and and then we'd go in and would sell 20 percent of that advertising with stock weighting with a, a retailer like chemist warehouse or priceline or woolworths or coles like we did with the olympics as well it just progressed on and on and we and we kept taking on other titles that were global as well so all of these titles cricket Dancing with the Stars, the Olympics, they, they, were, they were overseas as well. So um, by thinking global and, and getting these global assets, it enabled us to connect with global markets. And then also each of the retailers got really excited about it because suddenly it was personal. It wasn't about target audiences or sections of the markets. It was about Ricky Ponting and the cricket. And, you know, every executive wanted to be involved with the Ricky Ponting campaign that Swiss uh, was, was doing or, or if it was a female band audience, um, you know, like Priceline, we would do something like Far More Wants a Wife. But interestingly, even Priceline, who had a lot of males in their management team, one of the, the Ricky Ponning adverts, and, and, you know, 70% of the audience was male, and, and it showed how powerful it was because 80% of their, their shopper back then was female. And, and so they were even prepared to, to make a decision like that based on the star power. We went back to them with the tennis, which was much more female friendly. Yep. And again, would underpin all of the advertising activity with stock sell-ins and um, campaigns that would target people to go and shop at Priceline that would see the tennis adverts and, and then be reinforced by point of sale. Is this when Leighton was? Uh, yeah, the Leighton Hewitt, and we had Yvonne Gulagong um, as well. And so, yeah, so we would pick the right sorts of personalities, and then those personalities would be exclusive to those retailers and, and tell the story from there. So that's a lot of the external stuff. But you kind of asked this where this all started. You asked me about how inspired the team. Yeah, and, and what drove the strategy. Yeah. Correct. So that was the secret sauce. So driving this, the strategy was our culture. Yeah, no one can copy your culture. And so how you create purpose in an organisation, uh, from our point of view, was, was focused on values and living out the values. And we've all worked in organisations where the values are up on the wall, but they never get talked about again. And Correct. it's the first thing I do do now when anyone's presenting on their values for their business. I say, well, cover your eyes <laughs> and uh, <laughs> tell me what they are. <laughs> Most of the time, they've got no idea. So they haven't really thought about them. And now if you think about your, your business principles, so your, your deliverables on a business plan, you'll know you, the margin you've got to deliver, you'll know the revenue you've got to deliver, you know the profit you've got to deliver. Your values create your culture. And unless your values are alive and well and are used in making decisions and thought about and are fundamental to the principles in, in operating the organisation, they're an absolute waste of time. But if you do respect that, that they can be a powerful tool like a business plan can be or a communications plan can be in success, uh, they can be extraordinary in galvanising people behind uh, a purpose. How important is being prepared to fail then? So you're, you're um, as you said, uh, when, yeah. you look at, when you look at the catalogue <laughs> of people uh, in regards to your ambassador strategy, I'm sure there's lots of stories behind some of those deals. Are they signing up because they're buying your values? Are they signing up because they want the dough? They're signing up because they believe in the product. How do you convince them? But also, how do you bring everybody along in that journey? Yeah, I think that you have to be honest and true about what you get right, um, but also about what goes wrong. Yeah. And interestingly, when we ever we did values workshops, which we would do as frequently as a business planning workshop, the first thing that people would come up is that they want honesty. And honesty is a two-edged sword. I'd love it when it did come up because I'd say, great, we can be honest about when things are going well, but we're also going to be honest about when they're not. And, you know, I honestly should have been fired four times over in, as a CEO at least. <laughs> and every time I hung on, I learned and became better as a result of that. And I also talked about those mistakes and I'd openly say, hey, I got this wrong and, and, um, and this is my fault. Um, and it created a culture of acceptance that we're human and we do get things wrong, but we've got to learn, grow and improve from it. And that became actually one of the, 
one of our, our uh, sayings that kind of reinforced what our culture was about. Rather than when someone got something wrong, and, and this was a production meeting where our head of production, he was a he was a, from Kazakhstan and he had a very heavy Russian accent. And we're asking him why we've got something wrong. And he said, Radek, it was a, a learn, grow, and improve moment. And I said, fantastic, LGI. And, and from then on, that was that was how we dealt with whatever challenge rather than problem we were facing it was a positive way of dealing with it and how i liken most workplaces is that you know if you go to a personal trainer and that personal trainer says okay we're going to do 10 push-ups and after five they say you look tired today you're not going to get through this forget it that's a terrible personal trainer mm. so many workplaces are geared like that they're not thinking about constructive language thinking about how we can move the organization forward in a positive fashion our language is so important so living and breathing that as a leader it's essential and then yeah making sure that you pick the right ambassadors and just like picking the right team members you get it right a lot of the time but um sometimes you get it wrong and and you need to be prepared to accept that you know we we had James O'Connor as an ambassador uh, through some difficult times. We had Cadell Evans after the um, uh, Tour de France, which I think yeah, he came right. fifth, yeah. which was a pretty damn great effort. Yeah. But he, he was our main face for the Olympics. And so all of a sudden he pulled out of his race. And so we're, we're selling a supplements product and we don't have Cadell um, actually on, on the bike pedaling. So, uh, but that, that's that's life, isn't it? Or, or Ricky Ponning, you know, he's third year in. I think they'll bowl out for less than 80 on the first day of the Ashes uh, in, in, in the Boxing Day test. And, and it was an absolute write-off for us. It was interesting. Customers would write to us and tell us, well, what have you done to, to Ricky Ponning? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the pressure was on at various times. <laughs> the ambassador strategy, was that central to the success of the business? I think what was central was not just letting one personality vampire uh, the yep. brand yep. and it being ubiquitous and, yep. and being so many personalities. I think in the end we had over 300 different yes. ambassadors represent Swiss. Um, and, and, you know, it was John Bertrand, uh, Matt Target, swimmer. Um, that was another classic one. They had the they were doing the four by four one hundred relay, and I don't, don't I don't know if you remember that they were in the middle of the, the problems with the swim culture back there. Um, so that was another challenge. But luckily, we had Liz Liz Cambage. It would be a bit of a challenge these days. But back then, she was an absolute superstar, and she yeah. slam dunked for us in the Olympics. So we had her as a twenty one year old, um, and she slam dunked in our advert too. So that was pretty exciting. So yeah, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong, and and that ambassador strategy, but the way we multiplied it and, and just kept going and, and created a whole lot of cost-effective ads. We wouldn't spend a whole heap on the ad. We would spend more on the talent and create basic ads around that, um, that that got people excited about our product and got talkability going. Looking forward to today, Radic, would that strategy still cut through? No, no. So what's, cha uh, what's, what's changed? The media landscape's changed. So definitely there, there's still a, a big audience out there in TV land. Uh, you, you'll struggle to go and get a million views, which is what uh, on, on YouTube, um, what you might get. And that's a global views just in Australia. And so you can sponsor the news and, and have an advert run knowing that a million people will watch it. Um, but back then uh, there weren't distractions. So you, you wouldn't look to your phone as regularly as what we now look to the phone. Uh, you wouldn't be able to fast forward the adverts. So you really need to think about integration, uh, take it a step further like we were starting to do and, and really reinvent the way you get to a consumer, which is you know how I view it is everyone gets marketing and testing results and uh, research results. And, and so, and you're all going to get very much similar answers. And I'll never forget when I first noticed this phenomenon, all my competitors and even health insurance ads, I would do this exercise of just blocking out the brand of what yep. they were advertising. Yep. And they all look like the same advert. And so it, the consumer gets completely confused. You've got to make it really simple. And that's why the consistency of our adverts was really, really key to our success in getting cut through and people would say to me swiss is everywhere and we were you know we were up there as one of the biggest spenders in, in some of the later years but we weren't always there and and people would feel that way and see that way and our adverts would get cut through for all the reasons i've just talked through but yeah that this this new media landscape 
is something I'm faced with our new venture, Wonderlust. And the kind of the different approach we're doing there is we've got an events driven approach where the brand uh, was and, and is at the largest yoga festival globally and ha had over 50 events pre COVID. And so it's got a really large following that will now transfer into a brand which we've done uh, that's in over 2000 pharmacies and over 55 different products. And, and so, so those events along with things like TV, digital billboards, they will champion the brand and position us as a, an authority in wellness. So if I was a billionaire, right, and I came and saw you and said, let's do Swiss Mark too. Mm -hmm. So oh, okay, you know, all the values are right and we believe we are, you know, health and wellness as well. Are we going to use influencers these days then? Uh, well, I think that you, what you first do is you go into the retail store. And this is, this is what struck me is going into retail like a chemist warehouse, there are walls of just the same products. And so that's an issue. They're all selling the same vitamin C, the same fish oil, the same uh, multivitamins. And, and so there's some nuances in quality and formulations, but those single ingredient products are essentially, you know, quite difficult to differentiate in. And they all produce from the same place too, Braddock? At the end of the day are they all manufactured in the same part of the world uh yeah the majority well the raw materials uh you know they're big players and and so some you know for instance vitamin c you can only purchase from the china and they also have a monopoly on on vitamin e but you know there's some innovative uh ingredients like beta carotene that come out of europe uh and all sorts of grapeseed extracts and and so it's the kind of different positioning and, and the technology that supports the extraction process that creates differentiation in the market. And then the manufacturing, yeah, the majority, we, we do manufacturing well here in Australia. We've really got good uh, structures for it being a medicinal product managed by the, the, the TGA, which gives us great standards here in Australia. Uh, globally, US and, and Europe are, are good manufacturers as well, um, as well as you can go to China and, and India. But in our category, I, I think because of the complicated nature of making the ingredients we do, it's not like a drug where it's one molecule. You've got many ingredients that you're mixing and, and they're natural ingredients. So they're variable and, and have great challenges in bringing them together. So picking really outstanding plants is essential and, and doesn't cost too much more than going to somewhere like China or India. And so, yeah, back to your question. Yeah, so I'm walking through that chemist. I'm walking into that chemist or I'm walking into that retailer. They're all the same. Yeah, and, and that's where it stood out for me to create Wonderlast, where, was, where it's, it's a plant-based nutrition range and it's focused on vegans. It's, uh, it's not its only position. Everything is plant-based and it's minimal fillers. So there, there aren't any artificial elements to it and everything's natural. And so that's sort of going back to the roots of, of what natural medicine's about. Um, and so, so that, that is a unique product in the category. And, and there's no way I was going to go back and be another Swiss or be another Blackmores. They do what they do really, really well. Yep. And Swiss became successful because it was so different to what Blackmores presented in the category. And I'm hoping Wonderlust will be successful because it is so different. And it's a 30% premium. It's more expensive to manufacture like we are. Plant-based ingredients, uh, we don't use any synthetics. And so that's more expensive to do so. All right. Now, Swiss had its ups and downs, and I'm not sure this is true or not, but I was told from someone, was there a stage there at one point you could barely afford the payroll and you personally went down to the bank and uh, got a loan to cover it? <laughs> well, I reckon there's plenty of situations, yeah, where we were really working over um, every bit of cash flow we could. Uh, we, we had insurers from contract manufacturers coming in doing full audits on where we were at and telling us, you guys are not solvent. <laughs> uh, we disagree. And, and we got through. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there were, there were very many sleepless nights and, and at various stages of the journey. It was high risk what we did, yeah. um, but it was high reward and high return. And, um, yeah, right up until, you know, the nine months out before we sold for $1.7 billion, um, we got valued by our bank with, you know, $70 million debt at 30 mil after the, the $70 million debt, so 100 mil yeah. uh, with the debt. So that was a massive dynamic turnaround. And I obviously felt that we had a lot more growth in where we could get to. And, and I suppose the, the craziness of vision, you know, the bigger, bolder vision saw us through some of those challenges where, yeah, we, were, we would lean on our banks to get deals done and, and we worked things over as hard as we could. But I think that you don't end up with an ultimate outcome unless you push things 
to the extreme. You know, if, if you're going to be a, a hundred meter runner and win the gold medal, you, you have to make sacrifices and you need to push yourself really, really hard. You can't cheat because yeah. you get found out. Uh, but but you, you need to be at your professional best. Our profession is what we did to an elite level. And that, that culminated in, in the extraordinary result that ended up in, in selling the business in, in 2015. Two points before we get to that part. What would you have done differently in hindsight? I would have been kinder to myself. I talk a lot about controlling the controllables in life. And, and part of that was you know, getting up and going for a walk with my wife every morning um, with a clear head and, and getting ready for work. I'd work out four to five times a week. There were long periods where I didn't drink. And I meditated for the last kind of three years, uh, twice a day for 20, 20 minutes a day. And probably starting that earlier and just, just accepting that, that um, you know, things were going to be hard and getting myself in the best mental state to deal with what we dealt with in the end. Okay. What did you love most about the Swiss journey? I love that culture. The fact that, you know, we, we regularly I'd have partners or, or husbands, wives tell me how much of a better person people had become as a result of working at Swiss and, and, and our positive outlook in how we went about things. And you know, we wouldn't say, dear, such and such on an email, it was great one to you or fantastic day to you. And it would end up with, you know, don't forget to celebrate life every day, Khaled, which sounds a bit dorky, puts a smile on your face and purposely so, uh, because that's what our products do. They help you celebrate life every day. And and part of why our products work is the holistic approach, you know. Um, it's not only the nutrition, it's the mindfulness, the right state of mind um, and activity and movement. So that, that holistic approach gets us our best health outcomes. And so, you know, if we didn't have a great culture, we weren't really living out um, that holistic approach, you know, having a, a great place for people to work. So that was what I was most proud of. We, we won best employer many times over. Yeah, and that was how it all played out. And as I said, those sad, satisfying moments and getting feedback like that was pretty extraordinary. And what did you like least about the journey? I, I didn't like politics, yeah. Politics is the most challenging part. I'm a very straight person and you'll hear what I think to your face and, and, and the same back. Um, I expect, but that's not for everyone, and I accept that. But the politics that would come from that would, would just be exhausting, you know, sometime. And, and, look, we didn't have much politics, to be honest, um, but, you know, as, as we got bigger and larger, it was impossible to, to not accept that politics would, would play a part. If I've done my homework on you guys, I know you've, you've had some ups and downs. I know cash yeah. is tight. I know you're down seeing yeah. the bank. Why am I paying $1.7 billion? The fact that we could pull out of the marketing activity. Did. So when we were at a kind of, yeah, when we were breaking even or losing money, we were still spending $50 million on advertising. So the easiest thing you could do was to stop the advertising. It wasn't contracted. And all of a sudden you're adding 50 million bucks to the bottom line. That was one part. We improved our gross margin from being 40% to 60% uh, by the time we were about to sell our business. You know, we sold with a business doing about 130-odd mil, 140-odd uh, mil profit. 12 months on, you know, I still had 30% of my shares. We were doing 300 million EBITDA. So it just had so much momentum in it and so much growth to go. That's when you sell your business, when you've got tailwinds rather than uh, wins the other way. <laughs> Things are sort of falling apart as you sell. It's not hard to say goodbye then? Uh, it was actually really satisfying to say goodbye because I was traveling two, three weeks of every month and I just wasn't the guy to be the global CEO. I was the guy to, to grow it and turn it into what it was. And that had sort of dawned on me in that sort of last two years and it was exhausting. So, you know, when we sold, I, I, I said to my wife, you know, everyone was really excited. You know, it's fantastic. And I, you know, I, was, I was just exhausted. And I said, I rang Helen. I said, can you make me some chicken soup. Your chicken soup's pretty damn good. And we did that. And we did enjoy a bottle of grudge that night, but it was pretty, pretty low key. <laughs> now you've taken the proceeds and established Light Warrior. What actually is that, Radic, for the audience out there? Yeah, so Light Warrior is meant to put a smile on your face. We're the warriors out there providing for the good folk, our foundation, Light Folk. And Light Warrior is what my wife said to me when, um, when she first fell in love with me, she said, you're my light warrior. So I thought that was a pretty cool name. So 
we stuck with it and we made it the name of our organisation. We had a number of bankers that worked with us, ex-bankers, you know, Goldman's bankers. So the guy who led, Adam Gregory, who led the, the Swiss sale on Goldman's behalf, he came across and we partnered up to form Light Warrior. And I just love the look on his face when he, uh, I said, this is going to be the name for our organisation. And, and he slept on it and came back and said, I love it. It's fantastic. And we'd have that same response from EBS or ex Goldman's people, the same thing. Uh, I can imagine when they went home and said, well, we're going to work for Light Warrior. And, and now, now, now we're more established and, and who we are, uh, it's a bit of an easier transition. Uh, but we, we want to, again, bring light to the world and do things with purpose and, and just recognise how important it is for us to lead um, in a way that's uh, creating a better society. So it's an investment house effectively? Yeah, so we kind of break it up into two portions. There's a there's a portion that's focused on our investment portfolio, which is our bank, and it funds the ventures. And the investment portfolio has a, a small team that focus on that. And, and that's getting tried and true returns that essentially help us break even as an office. And then the ventures are the, the kind of get out there and, and focus on a mission. And, and we started really wide and that was great, but all of a sudden I just found myself busier than I've ever been and probably putting in you know as much effort as I would as a majority uh, shareholder as a minority. And so, so slowly we've been um, transitioning those minority shareholdings um, and stepping away as directors, but you know, having left great teams in place and, and great momentum happening for them. We, we've just got really primarily focused on, on wellness and impact investment. I focus on the wellness side, on the inspiration for the impact side, but our wonderful group of bankers and finance-driven peoples are managing the funds that we, we now um, operate. Now, I've been reading a bit about you. You've been described as a deep thinker, always listening, analytical and insightful, creative, dynamic and entrepreneurial. Well, that's some pretty good uh, commentary here about you, Radek. Where do you think your strengths really are? There's some of the kind things people have said, so thank you for me. <laughs> There's plenty of others. It was like it was a great one. In, in it went national um, when uh, we had a, an issue with one of our claims. We always say you'll feel better on Swiss, and one of our competitors complained about the fact we were using it, and we had used it for ten years, and it was a marketing position. And and all of a sudden, the TGA said, "No, you can't use that anymore." And so the headlines were tired, stressed, you won't feel better on Swiss. Uh, page three across the country of every Sunday newspaper, when Sunday newspapers were really read back then, yeah. so it was a good few million people that read that. And then the next day was a, you know, a personal attack of me jumping up, which I, I stupidly did for a, a journal, a, a photographer in the water with my legs in the air like a Toyota ad, and it said, <laughs> celeb-loving CEO. <laughs> and that went on to slam me. So that was one of many that I've been slammed in. Um, but yeah, the, 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 I've forgotten now what you said. <laughs> well, to, I, I guess I was going to say some well, things. But what was the? Well, what do you what's, what do you reckon? You, not the key strengths. That's a cliche. Mm -hmm. But what do you what do you bring mm -hmm. to the table in that sense of what I bring to the table? Yeah, I, I think uh, authenticity, admitting that when I the things I don't know, uh, and getting away from that. But when you know when I can add stuff it is. Where I can add stuff is creating purpose, um, creating a, a brand that's authentic, yeah, and consumers can see, um, you know, can see that in this day and age. They're, they're learned, they're more educated. They want a brand built on values, um, not just uh, organisation that, that is culturally, you know, a great place to be, but also the, the health of our planet's thought about, you know, everyone in our supply chain, you know, wanting to work with us. And, you know, that's, that's something I've always emphasised with our team is, be the rock star that every group wants to work with, you know, be the supplier that everyone wants to partner with, be the organisation that the bankers want to work with. You know, as much as we had difficult times and we had to ask banks for support, they would always support us because we were good blokes about it, you know, we're good people about it. Um, and we did it with a smile on our face. Uh, and, you know, I never let anyone pay for a lunch bill um, that's a supplier or someone we work with because they do so much for us. And, you know, advertising agencies would flip out or TV stations going, hang on, you're paying for our bill? Um, I'd sneak away and do that because it's just just that that difference of, of being that choice partner where people will do that extra 1%. So relationships are still alive and um, they're still as important as ever. So our focus on culture, our point of difference and, and how we optimise that and, and connect with the consumer in a way that's above and beyond the average. Yeah, but I always find it pretty interesting. You know, you read the old management books or you see these big CEOs get up 
And the classic line is always surround yourself by people smarter than you okay, mm. or better than you. That's all good if you can afford them. But if you're a startup <laughs> and you go back to Swiss and you're 30 people deep and that's it, how do you do it in that regard? How do you get these investment bankers on site, mm -hmm. as you say? How do you put that idea and say, you're dealing with a bunch of rock stars? Mate, you, you guys haven't got a guitar, as far as I can see. So how, how are you <laughs> going to be a rock star? <laughs> yeah, and that's why it's, it's a game of inches. And you've got to, <laughs> you've sure, got to know it? You, it is absolutely bang on. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, so when I was at that, those barbecues, I, I quickly realized that if I was going to be the guy that works at the Swiss embassy that wasn't really working at the embassy, I'm not going to attract great talent. And then, you know, if, if it was a topic that people didn't really want to talk about, it's, I'm going to struggle again to inspire uh, people to come and work with me. So that became my prerogative is creating this aspirational workplace and brand that went with it. So then people were attracted to it. But you know, first and foremost, I took back to relationships and that getting, you know, you, you get, getting a start in business. It should also be getting you a start and getting great talent. I hired all my best mates. I hired my wife. Um, and and yeah, that, that you don't feel bad about that? You don't, you don't feel bad about that? Because, because <laughs> well, so they know you've got friends and stuff and you don't want to lose friends if things go wrong. Yeah. That's the catch-22. It does go wrong. I've had to fire family members. I've had family members fired by business partners. I've had I've had to fire best mates. Um, it, it happens. Um, or businesses have you know not gone to plan, and best mates have lost their job. Like it, it happens, and that's business, and and that needs to be talked about at the start. And you need to be harder on those people than anyone else in the organisation to make sure you maintain um, the quality. And, and you need to get your mix right too. You can't just be surrounded by those people that, you know, your your team that get things done. You need diversity and, and strength of opinion and that team ever growing. And that's how those businesses that we've invested in as a minority have been successful because we've brought great people in and now we're leaving them to, to carry on the march. And, and you know, Wonderlust is a blend of ex-Swiss people but also extraordinary leaders from other businesses um, and it will be successful because of that blend and the diversity of those personalities in, in sort of gender format, also in background, in nationality, all of those things you've got to think about. But it goes back to, you know, where you start out, you start out with your network. You run out of ideas, Radic? Oh, there's never any shortage of ideas. <laughs> but that's the easy part. It's making them into something that's uh, useful. It's the next step. And, and I think going back to that, that listening part, so much inspiration comes from conversation. So much inspiration just comes from hearing people out. And this is where research, and I've referred to a little bit and how it kind of makes everything the same. It can be something people hide behind and it's all they do. And it's really important. You've got to have the research toolbox done. Uh, and, and I think Steve Job made the, the fantastic um, you know, quote where he, he talks about the Apple iPhone would never have been born from research. It, 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 people don't know what they want in a lot of scenarios. And whilst you get some nuggets from research, you need to go out there and talk to who your customer is. And I love standing when someone's about to purchase a product, asking, why are you purchasing it? Why, do you, why didn't you go for this one? And, and just hearing directly from them. It's a bit strange at first getting into those conversations, but you settle in, you work out a way to, to make it comfortable. And then also with the retailer who, who's looking and seeing and, and is fundamental to selling your product um, and just listening to them. Some of our best ideas came from buyers at Chemist Warehouse, Coles, Woolworths, Terry White, all those groups. The cliche the customers know, you know, make sure you give customers what they want. I, mm. I don't know customers know what they want, do they? Yeah. Hey, how do I know I need your vitamins X, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G plus, whatever it is, right? Correct. Yeah. And it's ever frustrating that we do go to trying to look to the past in sales results to kind of create new opportunities. And there's some really good defining of, of strategy that we did back in the day with Melbourne Business School around red and blue ocean strategies. And red oceans is, is around the knowns and, and fighting for the commodity style categories. And that's effective for some organizations, but only for a period of time. But then you got your blue ocean. So your blue ocean thinking. So um, I never say we have a brainstorming session. I call it a blue sky session because brainstorming sounds like it's kind of confusing and you're not going to end up with a result. We want a big blue sky and, and think that the sky is really the beginning. So it's choosing words that, that enable bigger thinking and, and goes back to 
you know, the Swiss days where we thought global always because of our branding. So if you're thinking big and broad, you start to redefine things. And, and I think the really other interesting thing to do is, and which I alluded to, was taking other successful categories and, and clashing them with yours. So we were borrowing from that, the cosmetic section or the aftershave section of the pharmacy and bringing dynamics of that to a category that it kind of, you know, was growing at 2% when we started. And when I left, it was at over 20% growth and we'd grown 50% compound growth for 10 years straight. Um, so we're 50% bigger company every year. But that happened because we brought the best of two categories together. And, and so that, that clash that happens, that disruption that, that occurs by looking at successes of other categories and bringing them into to yours in what might seem a, a boring flat category can suddenly reinvigorate it and make it pretty exciting. So when you're assessing businesses this day and age to invest in, are you still sticking by the, the P's, which is the people, principle, passion, and profit will follow? Is that still the uh, mantra? 100%. And there's always great debate over that, that fourth P, uh, profit, over whether it's as important as those other three, which I love. It's fantastic when people are talking about because that's values alive and well. And they're easy to remember and we talk about and reference them. And we actually build business plans around uh, values. Now, we start with that as our proposition, but then the business becomes its own personality and creates its own value set that are relevant um, to that organization. Interestingly, those values were, were our Swiss values, core values, but they also carried on to be our, our values at, at Light Warrior. And, and they're theirs for anyone to, to use. Um, we're really happy if people are uh, emulating our values proposition. It's high performance, thing. you talk about high performance, Radic. Mm. How many times do you actually see it exist in business? It, it, big, it's rare. big cliche, high performance. High performance. Rare. I, I, I go back to that uh, choice that we have. We spend more time at work than anything else we do. You know, why not make the choice to be extraordinary at it? Why waste your time? Don't turn up and be miserable there. And there are plenty of organisations where you can be miserable at. And I regularly tell, you know, tell people in their first three months, and it wouldn't actually have to come from me, most of our team would decide for themselves that, hey, you're miserable and you're going to be a whole lot happier in a miserable organization. So this place isn't for you. And so it's having those open, honest conversations. So if we look at sporting um, analogies or mm -hmm. even drama, or you have a director making a movie, a director making a musical or a director running an orchestra and they're a coach and that director and that team is there to drive high performance. And there's permission to talk about how you can play the guitar player better or how, how you can kick the ball better. They have breaks in football games. Um, so the coach talks to them. Can you imagine if the, the team member turned around and said, get staffed, so I disagree with you. We can see them emotionally walking around. That's what happens in workplaces. Yep. We get so upset when we get into a meeting and talk about what went right and wrong. You can see people's faces can't cope with it. We've got to get comfortable with that. To be truly high performance, we've got to get over the fact that we've got to have conversations that can be challenging and are going to push us to be better, but that's the most fulfilling thing. I mean, I've had a bad girlfriend in the past, and I'm sure we've all had that bad relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, at one stage of our life, and I wasn't a great person, and that other person wasn't a great person either. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I got out of it, and, and everyone afterwards said, oh, wow, well done. You got it. You're so much better off now as a result of doing that. And we've all been there. Uh, and we've all had some toxic relationship in our life that's just made us, you know, not great. And, and that, that's what a lot of these workplaces are, toxic relationships. We've got to have relationships like I have with my wife or I have with, you know, I spot I have with all our businesses where we're bringing out the best in each other. And that's hard work. It's not easy. You have some confronting conversations and you're working on each other all the time, but you're getting to a better place. That's rewarding, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. What happens when you're, um, you're stuck or you're stagnated? What do, what do you do? Oh, I think change is, is something that we shield ourselves from. Whenever I ask a group of people, you know, do you like change? Everybody goes, oh, yeah, I love change. And that's rubbish. We all hate change. Uh, you know, we, we've got to work for it. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, you, you've been told you have to say that, but that's okay. <laughs> you've been told it in a good way. So you've obviously come from a high-performance culture, if you truly believe that. So that's good. Because um, high-performance drives change, and it's not easy to change. You know, we, we're always saying for it, we're creatures of habit, and, you know, we, we, we like to brush our teeth every day. We like to have a shower every day. We like to wake up in the same bed every day. We, we like to get up around the same time. We like to go to bed the same time. You know, everything is a habit in our lives. So to create change is pretty challenging because around imagine if i said no you can't brush your teeth for three or four days and you're not allowed to sleep in the same bed you have to move bedrooms every night uh that's all change isn't it mm. and and so so we need to encourage each other to change and so change is is our greatest challenge and creating a format or a expectancy that that's that's the fundamental of how business is going to be is going to keep you ahead of being stagnant and personally as well and so i see some of the greatest leaders if I look at entrepreneurs like Zuckerberg, Branson, Oprah Winfrey, Madonna, uh, the amount of change that they went through to be who they are and continue to be the change makers they, they continue to be, that's because they are looking in the mirror and going, how am I changing? How am I keeping up with the world um, and not stagnating? What's the best advice you've ever received? I think it's all, all been around this kind of, positive notion yeah you, you will notice i keep saying we instead of i and that's because uh it was really heavily impressed upon me by that managing director michael saba um the importance of language and and the choice of our language and how it galvanizes the team and creates purpose in an organization so i, I thank michael so much for for that grandy making decisions under pressure how do you go about it you want to bounce it around do you call michael up do you go and speak to your wife? Do you go for a walk around the block? You got a big call to make. How do you go about it? I, I love getting everyone around the table for that and getting everyone's buying thought and understanding about what we're going to do and what it could mean. And, and many times we'd have the conversation about if we do this advertising initiative, what's the worst you know, outcome of it? And, and the worst outcome was, you know, we're, my other business partner, Stephen and, and Michael, would all have to get back on the tools and, and the three of us would be the organisation and we went, okay, we can deal with that. We, we'll get through and, and we'll rebuild. And so I think starting out with worst case and whether you're comfortable with worst case helps you navigate big decisions. And what do you wish you knew about business, say, 20 years ago? Is it all about the people? The amazing thing is experience just makes us all better. If I was able to channel that as 25 and, and you know, leading a, a business unit at Village Roadshow, uh, I probably would have been a much better manager, uh, but I probably wouldn't have been as, as brash and have a lack of the fear of the unknown <laughs> uh, like I did. So I remember when the GFC happened, I was like, oh, what's going to happen? You know, what's that mean? A downturn? I don't know. <laughs> and, and it didn't mean a, a decrease in sales of product, but what it did mean is our wholesalers went from carrying eight weeks of stock to four. And for a growing business that was growing at 50% and kept growing through that, all of a sudden, you know, I, I got an appreciation of the cost of capital and how important that was. And, and you know, we, we didn't have orders for a month. And you were, when you're flying by the seat of your pants and each month counts as your kind of next growth program, you go, whoa, yeah, that's when you're calling the bank and saying, we need your help. And here's the fundamentals of what's happening. Uh, will you support us through it? You find most people willing to help? I think if you're a good person, yeah. And if you choose the right people to work with, I think that that's, that's a really important part is, um, is chemistry. In the outside of work, you talk a lot, of, obviously, about um, well-being mindfulness, meditation, nutrition. So what's your sort of routine? It's ever changing and ever trying to um, become sort of more suitable for where I'm at in my life. So I'm lucky enough to work out a good four or five times a week, but I have to have a trainer. I'm, I'm useless unless the trainer turns up and says, you got to be here and do it. Um, and I practice yoga three times a week. I'm not, not the best at it, but I'm getting better as a result of, of practicing. And mindfulness, I, I meditate in stressful times, twice per day for 20 minutes, and then at least once a day uh, for 20 minutes. And at the moment, I'm doing some other exercises just to help me um, with my grounding in preparation for my yoga. So um, that's some breathing exercises and your constants of breath. You know, just you get into a stressful situation, 
remaining calm and, and focused on the way to get through it is the best way to deal with it, not reacting and, and getting into fear mode and, and dealing with it from a place of uh, concern or, or major stress. So, um, but we naturally do that. We're human. And so, you know, a lot of these things are tools to, to help me sharpen my focus and, and do what I do better. A couple of last things, Radek. Right? The economy, how do you see the state of the affairs for the Australian economy and maybe juxtapositions that against the, the global economy? How are we going? Well, I, I just think we've got to, we've got to take advantage of this, the biggest opportunity that presents in the, in the world and, and what capitalism loves doing is, is solving great problems, um, which is climate. We've got this, this great opportunity where we can get ahead of a fundamental issue that could cause the extinction of the human race. Now, I understand why, um, because, and, and I've learned this from dealing with government and, and working with government over many years, um, is the government react and they only react to crises. And so they reacted really well to COVID in this country, some conjecture over some of the politics that has gone on. And, and that's been really difficult for us to accept. But overall, we, we've gone pretty well and the economy is in great shape after it. And so the reaction is, and it's been pretty strong and, and it's happened. You know, and having worked with government and people that are in senior government roles that have come from corporate, they go, Radic, this runs completely different to how corporates run. He goes, one tip I'll give you, Radic, is that government only react when the house is burning down. And, you know, that productivity that happens in business where something's going right, you go and invest more money in it. Yep. That happens in complete reverse of government. If something's going right, less money goes towards it because they've got it in hand now and it goes to the next crisis. Um, so we, we need to, as a democracy and capitalism, we need to make a shift away from that and become far more proactive. And, you know, we had, whether you like him or not, Malcolm Turnbull talk about innovation as a campaign message in his last run for being prime minister. It did win him the prime ministership, not by as much as many wanted him to, um, and because he came from that business world. He knows that innovation is, is central to the success of any organisation and Australia is no different to an organisation as a, as a country. And, and so we need to get ahead of this thing, climate, and we're in the best possible seat to do that. We, we have resources um, in the ground as well as from the sky and our environment, wind, the size and scale of our land um, to really be the number one player in this space. And we're just not moving. We, we, we're getting there. The rest of the world's moving a whole lot faster than us and we're playing catch up and, and we just don't need to be doing that. So tough question for you then. What are you doing about it? And I'm not being smart when I say that. So <laughs> going back to the very first point you made where business is, we're a democracy, you know, everyone goes to work, big opportunity to influence the population. Yeah. What are you doing about it? Is there a get together? Is business really being, you know, some questions have been business really being strong enough and being vocal enough? You're a key businessman. What do you need to do? The tone from business is we want to get on with this and there wouldn't be any CEOs of big organisations that aren't saying, hey, we, we, we need government to support us getting on with it. And us as business leaders are doing exactly that. I mean, our impact fund is one of the biggest suppliers of, of behind the metre solar in the country and okay. also in New Zealand too. I devote a whole lot of my time, volunteer time, to this group called the Climate Leaders Coalition, which I'm on the organising committee for. We represent 30% of all emissions in Australia with our membership, um, the likes of BHP, Qantas, Santos, uh, Coles, West Farmers, you, you name it, are a part of SAP Zero. And it demands that the CEO's there for those meetings, and, and they are there. Okay. Um, and, and, and we have international speakers um, come and inspire us on, on how we can think about our journey forward and we've got working groups that we're we're all got initiatives that we're championed with um, implementing and and showing that they work we're, we're not about telling government what to do we're about setting the example and hopefully government following over time so you know one of mine my, my major focus is this um, the carbon investment scheme mm -hmm. uh, which is essentially uh, creating a you know, the biggest, and this is Richard Branson's idea. Is this, is this the B team or? Yeah, this is the B team. And the B team created the Climate Leaders Coalition. And, and Richard was out talking to us about 
in October, just pre-COVID, um, so that would have been 2019, he'd come out to Australia and he was talking to us about the beat team, but climate and it being his, his number one focus and concern. And But he saw that the biggest issue was investment and interesting reading uh, about Twiggy's adventures and, and, and green hydrogen today. He was talking about investment being the biggest challenge for them uh, solving green hydrogen and reinforcing that message. And so immediately it struck me that in Australia, we have superannuation, which is dealing with um, the, this, this aging population and, and was fundamentally dealt with by business uh, first through voluntary programs of superannuation and then embraced by government alike and it becoming a tax that we call superannuation. So it's positively positioned like the climate investment uh, scheme rather than, or carbon investment scheme rather than a carbon tax. And it's essentially also dealing with something that's in the future and very proactive in its thought process. So it's creating an internal pricing for carbon in organisations and that exists with say Microsoft that are already in, in the CLC. So we're sharing information on how we can build that out for other companies to have an internal carbon price, but create accountability for carbon footprint. So rather than the finance team at the end of the year say, oh, how much of that, what was our footprint? Now how much do we have to reinvest in activity that brings that footprint down? Everyone from the, you know, the, the marketing coordinator who might be organizing a um, conference and that footprint being costed to that action, just like you would be responsible for a budget, you're responsible for a carbon budget as well. And, and you have to think about that. Um, so we're creating that accountability and, and Microsoft are well progressed in that area, which is really exciting to be partnering with them on that. But then also looking at ways of creating a fund, which those organisations that can't do it themselves can invest in a fund and get returns like you do with super. Yep. And hopefully one day we're incentivized to do that as organisations to do it. So more funds go to, to dealing with this issue that we're, we're all faced with. So you could do, just funds, like at Swiss, we, we were carbon neutral from 2007, but I couldn't afford capital to go into solar, but I could afford the 50 odd thousand a year that would reduce my emissions through sustainability activities and that managed externally. And then there's no reason why you couldn't create that into a fund that delivers a, a return in dollars and cents in this day and age. So we're, we're building that. And so there'll be a fund for those organizations like Swiss Walls, or there'll be a blended fund where some of it's done by the organisation themselves, but they want to get to say maybe, maybe net zero by 2030, which is, you know, Coles are, have done, came up are, are well on the way to doing as well, which is pretty inspiring. You, you might need a blended model where you're, you're investing internally as well as in this fund to deliver that sort of outcome. So we're building that uh, practically and hopefully you know, through our businesses uh, piloting it, we'll get many more and, and it'll become global, just like um, our success in creating the pension funds through through super. Hopefully we'll have similar success through creating um, funds that are focused on solving the climate challenge we deal with. Radic, last question for you. If you were to look back at that young man starting out a village all those years ago, what advice would you give him today? It's going to be okay. That's a good line, that one. <laughs> Oh, thank you. It's been a very great pleasure to have a chat, Greg. <laughs> Radek, thank you very much for joining us today. We really enjoyed it. You're a gentleman. Thank you. You've been listening to No Limitations. Mm -hmm.